thinking of actual law, I agree with Yuri that to put her just attack, there's no possible way that it can be done as it has been described, that it doesn't appear consistent in violating both uh, export subsidy rules and uh, rules relating to national treatment for internal taxation. Um, but getting back to NAFTA, um, I think with respect to uh, all of President Trump's trade proposals and the proposal to renegotiate NAFTA, the first question you have to ask yourself is, if it were that easy, why hasn't it been done already? And on the campaign trail, the implication was, well, because every administration before was either incompetent or corrupt. Well, if you're someone who knows that that's not true, and I think most people in the room know that that's not true, uh, you still have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, if it's this easy, then why hasn't it been done before? Um, as was mentioned, I'm the former Deputy Assistant USTR for North America, and I can tell you that Mexico, Canada, and the United States have all wanted to change certain things in NAFTA. Uh, and although there has never been formal negotiations, we all know one another's desires, uh, and we've been at an impasse for 23 years. Um, there are things Mexico would like to change, there are things Canada would like to change. No American administration has been prepared to give them those concessions, and as a consequence, they're not prepared to give us ours, and that's why there have never been negotiations to renegotiate now. Enter President Trump, and the question then is, what has he introduced that's going to change that fundamental dynamic? The answer, he's threatened to withdraw from NAFTA if he doesn't get what he wants. Does that change the dynamic? If it's credible, it certainly does. Um, I would argue that that threat's not credible. And although the populations of the three countries believe he's serious, I don't believe he's serious, and I'd be very surprised if the leadership of Mexico or Canada or their trade officials believe he's serious. And as a consequence, I don't think the dynamic has changed. Uh, I think they're gonna be very diplomatic with President Trump and our administration, as they have to be, but I'm not convinced there really is going to be a serious renegotiation. Now, one question is, well, why is that threat not credible? And unfortunately, we don't have a, a lot of time to go into that. Um, but suffice it to say, the United States and Canada have the largest trading relationship between any two countries in the history of the world. And Mexico is our second largest export market. And we have so many supply chains that would be so severely disrupted um, that it almost spins one's head just to try to even wrap your brain around all of it. Economists agree that the move would be recessionary, deeply recessionary, but that's in the long run. In the short run, the disruption would be a lot worse. We haven't had a huge public outcry. We've got a lot of nervous sectors and uh, other groups, but we haven't had a huge public outcry because everyone's been lulled into the feeling, well, he's not really going to pull out of NAFTA, he's just going to renegotiate it, and he's just saying he's going to pull out to renegotiate it. But that all adds up to the threat to renegotiating it not being credible. If he actually, if or in my view, when the talks to renegotiate it are fully stuck in the mud and, and President Trump is facing actually withdrawing from NAFTA, I think there's going to be a public outcry that's going to shake not only the administration but Congress. Last thing I'll say on that subject, uh, which unfortunately we also don't have time to get into, is that even if President Trump were to withdraw from NAFTA, which he as the president has the authority to do, he's only pulling out of the agreement. Unless Congress repeals the NAFTA Implementation Act, not very much changes on the ground. And Congress will have uh, constituents throughout the country uh, screaming. Um, I just don't see it happening. Now that's a much more complex topic than we have time. Matt, I, I do want to sharpen that because I think that's something that, that really was highlighted in our discussions. And I want to be sure that everybody in the room understands this. Uh, your perspective on this is that if the president withdraws from NAFTA, and Congress takes no action, in effect, nothing changes for the companies that have uh, relied on NAFTA in their cross-border trade because the tariffs remain the same, the rules of origin remain the same, uh, the, uh, uh, the supply chain issues, the import quotas all remain the same. Is that correct? Initially, everything remains exactly the same. In initially, everything, nothing changes. Unless by Congress acts. By the mere withdrawal from the agreement. Yeah. The Congress obviously can change anything by revising the statute. The President himself has some delegated authorities by which he could um, roll back some of the NAFTA implementation, but only parts of it 
Um, the authorities are questionable in, in different areas. It, it's a very complex area where all the president's different authorities, but, but a, a Congress issued a report on that on December 16th, I believe, that lays out the different statutory authorities the president himself has. Um, but they only relate, first of all, to tariffs, um, not to any of the non-tariff barriers, which are 300 pages of, of commitments we have in NAFTA that only Congress can change. And his authority in tariffs is, is complex and limited. I, I could go into it in great detail, but we definitely don't have the time. But, but the point is, if Congress declined to act, yeah. and Mexico and Canada declined to come to the negotiating table, uh, no matter what President Trump does, other than these, this tariff authority, which is limited, NAFTA, the, the rules of NAFTA remain for North American companies that have benefited from it. Is that your perspective? That's correct. But I mean, I, again, if, if President Trump did come in and use the tariff authority and raise tariffs, then there probably would be a reaction in Mexico and not, like, and it would go into a downward spiral. But it is and that's part of the scenario planning that we're doing here. Yeah, but, but just withdrawing from the agreement itself, that act alone changes nothing on the ground. Um, at that point, we're still fulfilling every one of the terms of NAFTA, including the main term, which is lowering all ordinary customs duties down to zero, and the other 300 pages of terms as well. Um, we're still doing all of those, and it's, it's highly likely Mexico and Canada would continue to do all those with reference to us, as long as we did them all with reference to Mexico and Canada. Um, and if everyone could keep their discipline, and if also the president didn't use any of his limited authorities, that could stay into stasis through, through the end of the presidential term. It, in theory, could happen. Anyway, just to finish up, um, all of this leads me then to um, the fact that the last six months I've been predicting that the renegotiation, renegotiation of NAFTA is more of a fantasy than a reality, and, and it might never be more of a reality. Now let's look at what happened in the last two weeks. Um, because I see a lot of things going on diplomatically, and I, I infer what's going on behind the scenes, and I see a very different picture uh, of what's going on in the last two and a half weeks with respect to NAFTA renegotiation than the media is portraying. Um, first, no trilateral. Nobody seemed to notice that. NAFTA can only be discussed in a trilateral. A summit or a trilateral ministerial or trilateral talks. It's not even remotely possible to deal with it at a bilateral level. And even if uh, President Trump wants to negotiate bilaterally after NAFTA completely is failed or is gone, he's not at that stage. He wants to try first to renegotiate NAFTA, yet apparently Mexico and Canada have not agreed to a trilateral, a trilateral summit. Um, and keep in mind, every year we have a trilateral summit, the North American Leaders Summit, and it's around this time of year, and we also have every year a trilateral ministerial NAFTA Free Trade Commission, neither of those have been scheduled, uh, to the degree I'm aware. So all we had were two bilateral summits that were planned for the first month the president was in office. That told me a lot right there. Second, uh, what's on the agenda? These staffers are feverishly negotiating the agenda and the joint statement uh, for, for the summits. And that's the leaders communicating through the staffers. Um, I would have predicted that Mexico would have dug its heels in and would not have agreed to put any particular provision of NAFTA on the agenda for the meeting that was supposed to happen this month, nor would they agree to put any particular provision on the joint statement uh, in terms of an agreement to negotiate any particular provision of NAFTA going forward. I would have guessed they would have dug their heels in on that. What did we actually see publicly? First, as we got very close to the summit with Mexico, the president answered a question about what was on the agenda, and what he said was border security and immigration. In other words, no NAFTA issues. Second of all, then there was no summit. Now, if you think that the president of Mexico made that decision, you're not paying attention. President Trump made a statement that he knew would cause Mexico to pull out. I think that when he answered the question about what was on the agenda, he was floating the reality that, that he was going to be embarrassed that NAFTA was not going to be on the agenda to see what the reaction was going to be. And I think whatever feedback he got decided he didn't want to have a summit. And I think he then engaged in typical misdirection, um, ending the summit, making it look like Mexico pulled out, and making it look like the reason had nothing to do with NAFTA to cover the fact that he was about to get embarrassed about the fact that he's never had the power to force Mexico to renegotiate it, and he's finding that out right now for the first time. So you're saying it's sort of a, an unreality show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now from Canada. Take a good hard look at what's going on with Canada. Um, January 23rd, uh, Sean Spicer announced that uh, Justin Trudeau was going to be here within, quote, 30 days or so. Um, but they didn't have a date. Let me tell you how summits work. If you don't have a date, you don't know there's going to be a summit. Second, since all of that time, we haven't heard a word about a date for that summit. Third, 
Mexican president backs out. Well, this is the first leader who stood up to Donald Trump. So now what is Justin Trudeau going to do? I mean, this is a classic bully scenario. If the first kid who stands up to the bully gets pummeled and everyone else runs and hides in the corner, nobody stands up to the bully ever again. The first kid who stands up to the bully suddenly has the other kids coming to his help. The dynamic changes for the rest of the presidency. Justin Trudeau is really seriously at a tipping point right now. And all of a sudden, we don't get any news about when that summit's going to be. Now, it's widely reported that Trudeau is going all over Europe talking to European leaders, and it's widely reported that, and he has admitted this, they're talking about his strategy and how to manage Donald Trump. That's what they're talking about right now. It still hasn't given a date. Now, the Trump people are getting nervous. They're going to get embarrassed again if he doesn't meet. I mean, eventually, he has to have a meet and greet as Canada, but he doesn't have to do it in the next month or two. And he doesn't have to agree to put anything about NAFTA on the agenda if he doesn't want to. So all of a sudden, we have an announcement three days ago because there's pressure on the White House to say when the summit's going to be. Oh, don't worry, he's coming. And then yesterday, Kellyanne Conway, that was not an accident. Yesterday, um, Kellyanne Conway said, well, we, we think he's coming next week. <coughs> All of that, I think, is um, uh, the administration's way to put pressure on Justin Trudeau's shoulders to come for the summit. They're raising the stakes. They're making a high-profile question so that if he doesn't come, the stakes are bigger. Um, because they're trying to pressure him to come, because at this point, if he doesn't, it, it, he will eventually come. But if they turn around and say, well, there's no, no room on the schedule in February, and uh, March looks pretty busy, we're, get back to us in April. Up. Yeah, well, that's, that, I'm at the end. So he doesn't have to get back to us in April. Well, you know, um, it's going to be embarrassing. So I see, I see already this, this forward motion and after getting stuck in the mud. Um, now, I'm reading the tea leaves in a certain direction, but that's, that's what I see happening.